All right, so this is lecture seven, 14th of April, 2021. So what were we discussing last time? I kind of laid the ground for introducing the general approach for energy method which is called Rayleigh's methods. So I started with this example, which I'm going to do, but uh, let me write it down. So we are talking about energy method. And we said that as long as you have a system that is conservative, the time derivative of the sum of kinetic and potential energy is zero. And then I said that, okay, Mr. Sir uh, or Lord, whatever the title was for Mr. Rayleigh back then, I know he got some title from the king uh, because of the discovery of a number of fronts, including this one, was that this is what Rayleigh said. He said that, okay, if you have a structure, okay, which obviously has infinite number of degrees of uh, freedom, m1, m2, and so on, mn. And you can relate the displacement of all these points to that one degree of freedom, okay? We can use the radius, we can use the energy method to set up the equation of motion. Let's demonstrate this through a simple problem first, which I started last time. Let's say you have two masses, M1 and M2. This is at a distance of L over three from this, and this is at a distance of L. So what we discussed last time, or what Rayleigh said, if you can relate the displacement at any point to the displacement at the tip, and we're talking about right now the static displacement. In other words, if you have a beam subjected to a load at the end, assuming that the, the static displacement is analogous to the dynamic displacement, what is the displacement at this end? Is PL cubed over three EI. And the displacement at every point, U of X, if you call that, this is X, you only want to find the static displacement. U of X would be what? <clears throat> would be this, which is U of X, at x equal to L times, as we saw, this function, okay? Squared minus one half x over L cube. So Rayleigh said that let's assume that this relationship, as long as the displacement are, are small, is also valid for the uh, dynamic case. In other words, you, uh, you can write u at any x and any point can be written as the displacement at that x equal to l in the case of that cantilever beam, that's the degree of freedom we are interested in, times this function, which I call that phi of x. But remember, this is now a function of time. This is a function of time, okay? So what we do, uh, same thing if you, for instance, had a, uh, a simply supported beam. As long as you can find the static displacement shape for this, okay? You can assume that you have x and t can be related to that degree of freedom you're interested, u1 
of t, okay, times this v of x. So let's see what this is going to lead us to and what benefits we get from this assumption, okay? So I will go back to this example, okay, that we had before. Let's say we have these two long masses, M1 and M2. And using this assumption, we want to set up the kinetic and potential energy for this uh, case. What is the kinetic energy? Kinetic energy is one half of M1, which of course, times the velocity at that time, at that point, which is basically evaluating this function at x equal to L at time t, plus the kinetic energy of this mass, which is M2 times evaluating this function again, okay, at x equal to L over three and times t. Okay, so that's, uh, of course, squared. So that's the kinetic energy of this system, okay? So all I need in this equation, okay, I would just substitute for, you know, the values here in this equation, that means in, if you substitute this here, you have phi of x, right? So you're evaluating basically phi of x at L and phi of x at L over three. If you do that, you get one half M1 times U1 dot squared plus one half of M2 times evaluating phi, which is this function at x equal to L over three, will give you four over 27 U one dot squared. Okay. Everything would be just U one dot, right? And evaluated at that function because I didn't, um, include that one step because u dot is u1, right? Dot times this function, it's a function of x. So if you want to evaluate this, u1 dot would be simply u1 dot evaluated at x equal to L. And you see that phi of x as x equal to L is one. Phi of x at x equal to L over three is four over 27. Okay, so this is the kinetic energy. How about the potential energy? Potential um, energy- Professor? Uh, yes? Above, sorry, above 27, is that phi? 427 is phi of x evaluated at x equal to L over three. If you substitute L over three in this equation, Okay, that would become four over 27. So in order X is L over three, right? You can do that for yourself. So you have three over half times X is L over three divided by two, okay? Um, okay I'm sorry, divided, makes... divided, by, divided by L minus one half and that's squared and, and so on. If you do that, that's you see that's what's going to come out to be. L and L cancels out. This one would be L over three divided by L cubed. So evaluate these, add these up would be four over twenty-seven. Now, what is okay, the potential you. energy? Oh, you're welcome. What is the potential energy for a cantilever beam, uh, which is basically a spring, right? that is going through uh, you know, dynamic displacement. You haven't had this in 
the strength of material. The potential energy obviously is a, due to the deformation. And if you, um, I don't go through the derivation of that, but you just accept that from me, that potential energy for a cantilever beam going through deformation would be taking the derivative, second partial derivative of u with respect to x, okay, squared dx. You can find that from this integral, okay? I'm sure you say you have not had that before, and you're right, you haven't had that before, but I just gave that to you, okay? So that's the uh, kinetic energy of a cantilever beam, um, of, you know, going through the, the deformation U, okay? So for this problem then, all I need is just to evaluate these two, add them up, take the second derivative, second derivative with respect to time and equate that uh, to zero. And that's what I will do. So let's do that. Okay, so you, let me, okay. Okay, um, a T was what? I would write that down is one half of M1, U1 dot squared, right? That's what I did here. So I'm just gonna rewrite that here. Plus one half of M2 times four over 27, U1 dot squared. So this is kinetic energy. So let's evaluate the potential Professor, energy. Yes. Is the squared on the M2 term outside of the parentheses or on the U1 oh, here it is. Sorry, I should write it like this. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. So for potential energy, I need to evaluate that integral. So if you evaluate this integral from zero to L of EI, take the second derivative of this U, which is a function of X and T with respect to X and, okay, square that. What does that mean? All I have here is, this is U1, which is a function of T, okay? times the second derivative of basically that phi of x with respect to x squared. And then you need to square that and then put it into this integral, perform the integration. So I'm going to skip that in that step process. You can, you have that function of x, take the first derivative of that, then second derivative of that, square that, okay? And then U of T obviously is a function of T. You're performing this, this is the integration with respect to X. So U of T would come here. So this, you perform that integration, you will see this whole thing becomes three EI over two L cube times that U one of t squared. So that is going to be the potential energy, okay? So this is the potential energy, this is the kinetic energy. So all I need to do, add them up. So these two would be one half m1 u1 dot squared plus one half m2 times four over 27 u uh, one dot squared plus three EI over L two L cube times u one squared. So that's the sum of these two. <clears throat> okay. So take the derivative of this with respect to time equal to zero you take the derivative with respect to time, the only time dependent variables are these. So derivative of that would be two u1 dot u 
one double dot, derivative of this would be the same two u one dot u one double dot, and this one would be two u one u one dot equal equate to zero. U one dot obviously is a non-zero term, so you can uh, divide the two sides by that. And if you simplify this, you see that it comes out, this would lead to this equation, m1 plus 16 over 729 m2, okay? u1 double dot plus 3ei over lq u1 is equal to zero. So actually I was wrong, four, this is, this is also squared. That's where this value came from. So I better put this here. 427 is actually squared. So what did we get? Compare this with the general equation of motion. This is M equivalent. This is K equivalent. So M equivalent for this system then is M1 plus 16 over 729 M2. And K equivalent is simply 3EI over L cubed. So you can simply write the natural frequency. Okay. So you see that with this approach that Rayleigh suggested, which is only based on the assumption that if the displacement are small, dynamic displacement is almost follow the same pattern, but of course is time dependent displacement, but is related to the same function, which we call that displacement shape function. You can derive the equation of motion and find the equivalent stiffness, a mass and a stiffness. So you can follow this procedure and for as long for any problem, as long as you can have or find the displacement shape for that structure, if you follow this procedure, you can easily set up the equation of motions. So I'm going to just write down that procedure that we followed and then show you that following this procedure, how we can come up with a general formulation. So what is the premise of Rayleigh's method or what is it that we did? We, will, we, we, we can write the equation for static deflection as long as we have it for a cantilever beam, a simple supported beam, or even more complex structure, a cantilever beam or a simple supported beam, or even if you have something like this, if you don't remember from the strength of material, you can find, you can derive the, the displacement function for any of these. And so what we are trying to do is saying that, okay, I'm going to consider this as a single degree of freedom system where that degree of freedom is where the maximum displacement takes place, okay? So from static deflection, we can write the equation for that deformation deflection. Once you do that, you would relate, or you know, first of all, write the deflection at the maximum point of deflection. That's the point as I'm considering my degree of freedom, okay? Then you simply relate the deflection at any point to 
the point of maximum deflection. That's what we did for this cantilever beam, right? We found this, I call this U1 sub at X equal to L, right, or U1, which is the uh, displacement that I'm considering as my degree of freedom for the formulation. And I related the, this deflection at any point, okay, to this, okay? Then what the assumption we, the assumption we made was that assume same relation exists for dynamic displacement. In other words, if this becomes time dependent, same relationship exists. Okay? So you have been able to relate the displacement at any point X, meaning the displacement of any mass anywhere to the displacement at that single point. Once you do that, okay, you just use the concept of conservation of energy, which tells you that time derivative of these two energy with respect to time is equal to zero. And that's what you get. If you follow this procedure, Rayleigh demonstrated that, let's say if you have a cantilever beam, let's say with who knows how many masses, M1, M2, M3, Mn, that they're located, let's say at these distances given to A3, a4, An, and so on. Let's say in addition to that, we have these lumped stiffnesses that are also located at different points in this structure holding this beam in place. Let's say these are located at B1, B2. So the distance again from this tip is given. Following this procedure that I just outlined, okay, Rayleigh derived the equation for the potential and kinetic energy of this beam. The kinetic energy, you can easily obviously show that is sum of the kinetic energy of each individual mass, M mi u dot squared at evaluated at the location of these masses. And you can even take into account, because I'm sure this question comes out, that how about the beam is not massless, but has a mass density. You can include the kinetic energy corresponding to a beam with a distributed mass. You haven't had that formula or equation, but I'll just give it to you. Contribution from that distributed mass would be performing this integration, okay? So all you need to do, take evaluate this integral. So this is the complete kinetic energy for this beam. Well, remember U is simply U1 at X equal to L or U1, which is function of time as well, times that phi of X. Potential energy is what? potential energy of each of these springs, which would be subjected to displacements. So each stiffness times the corresponding displacement 
for these stiffnesses that are located at these locations, plus the potential energy of that beam, which is zero to L EI, second derivative of U with respect to X, which is X to uh, time, I'm sorry, squared dx, okay? And then you perform t this with respect to time equal to zero. If you do that, <laughs> if you perform this operation, okay? Rayleigh demonstrated, and you can of course go through that and do all these derivations and integrations and whatnot. And you will see that eventually by doing that, you come up with an equation of motion where M equivalent is simply the result of this rho times phi of x squared dx plus summation of mi for phi evaluated at location of these masses squared. That's what the outcome would be. And you can see the reason because here you're performing integration with respect to x. So u is a function of time comes out here and u comes out here. So you have Basically, the inertia uh, term comes out to be this, which is multiplied by that u1 uh, double dot squared. And if you do simplify that relationship for k equivalent, you see it comes down to this general form ei, which i can be even a function of x times the second derivative of x with uh, phi with respect to x is squared dx plus the sum of these ki phi evaluated at b sub i squared. Again, you can see that here because in this formulation, okay, phi is Again, you're taking second derivative with respect to time, but since this is with respect to x integration, u comes out and eventually that's what you get. So this is called general Rayleigh's formula. In other words, if you are given a structure you do not have to go through the deriving kinetic energy and potential energy anymore. Because based on this general derivation that we did, if you do and set up the equation of motion, you see that the inertia term and the stiffness term will be the outcome of these formulations. But the key is as long as you have the static deflected shape for that. So you just go either to a table for stress and stress strains, that famous table, famous book. Uh, you see that for instance, if you have a beam like this and you're looking at the vibration of this and your concern is that you want to formulate this as a single degree of freedom, and this is your degree of freedom, all you need to do find the static displacement shape, put it in here and evaluate these two. This may seem kind of simple, but imagine that when Mr. Rayleigh did this, okay, back then nobody knew how to deal with the vibratory motion of a multi-degree of freedom system. We didn't have matrix analysis. We didn't have finite element, none of these. So you appreciate that by the simple approach, Rayleigh could introduce a way to find the natural frequency of a relatively complex system. 
okay? And of course, the static displacement shape is easy or if they knew it, how to do it, you, you remember that, you know, all you need to do is uh, solve this differential equation, right? You've seen that in strength of material. So the key is, as long as you have this, you can use these to find the natural frequency of a complex system, okay? So let's demonstrate the application to some simple problems. And then I'm going to give you actually an assignment which is going to be your project number one. So don't get too excited. Let's first do a few problems. Let's say, I'm gonna start with a simple problem first. Let's say you have a water tower, weight of this water, the container holding the tower, the water is W. The column now is not massless. Remember in the previously we were assuming that the beam is massless. No, we are considering a mass density for that, okay? And other geometric properties are given, okay? One thing that I want to emphasize, rho in this formulation is mass density per length. Obviously you are uh, always given the mass density per volume, right? So all you need to do, multiply that by the cross-sectional area, that'll give you the mass density per length, okay? So we want to find the natural frequency of this beam or this water tower. For some reason we are interested, we want to make sure natural frequency is with outside the range that, for instance, the frequency of the wind that is blowing against this structure. <coughs> so all you need is look at this. This is the cantilever beam. So the, the static displacement function would be simply that relates displacement at any point to the displacement at here that we are interested. U1 is this. Okay. X over L squared minus one half X over L Q. So I don't have to go through setting up the uh, kinetic energy and potential energy. I just simply write the mass equivalent would be integral from zero to L of rho times phi of x, okay, squared dx plus, I have only one mass here. So that mass times that phi evaluated at a i, which is a location here, which is L. So that would be W over G times phi of X squared at X equal to L. Okay. So kinetic, I mean, put uh, the stiffness term would be you don't have any lumped springs here. So it would be only the um, potential energy due to the bending of this beam, which is EI phi with respect to the second derivative of phi with respect to X squared dx, which is this. I don't have this term in this problem. So all you need to do, write this equation phi of X, take the first derivative, and take the second derivative, okay? Put it here, square that, evaluate this integral. Same thing here, put that function here, square that, perform this integration with respect to x, evaluate this at x equal to L. If you do all of that, you see that for mass equivalent, you find W over G, this evaluated at x equal to L would be just one, Plus, if you perform this integral, that means square this whole thing and then take the integral evaluated from zero to L, you see the outcome would be 33 over 140 rho times L. Rho is, is a constant value, so it comes out of the integral, okay? 
So this is the mass equivalent. And K equivalent would be just outcome of this integration. If you do that, you would be surprised how simple the outcome is this. So the omega natural frequency can be simply evaluated. Of course, this was a very simple and straightforward uh, problem. So I assume you wouldn't have um, that many questions on that. Do you? Okay. If not, let me go over another uh, problem. And then we're going to do some more fun stuff, as you will see. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's look at another example. This is the example now we're going to look at. Let's say you have a rotating machinery with a disc in the middle of this simply supported beam. All the geometric and uh, material properties of this beam are given. Let's say this has a mass of M1. And we want to find the M equivalent and K equivalent because we want to find the natural frequency of this. In fact, Rayleigh's method was a huge help because back then they had developed these rotating machineries, power generation, you know, rotate, you know, uh, uh, you know, rotating machineries. And the concern was that how am I find, gonna find out what is the natural frequency of this system to prevent disaster failure due to resonance? So when you're designing this, you wanted to make sure what the natural frequency was and that's how Rayleigh came to help. But anyway, in this problem, what do we need to do? I am interested in this as being my degree of freedom, okay? So this is the maximum displacement for the for a beam under static load. Okay, I can relate the displacement at any point x to displacement at this point. Okay, so let me call displacement at any point v of x. If you go to your the strength of material book, you see that v of x is simply P, P over 48 EI, okay, times L cubed minus six L X squared plus four X cubed, okay? So this is the static displacement. This is V at the point of maximum or that U1 that we want, and this is a phi function, V of X, okay? So all I need to do is this, M equivalent would be, remember this equation, M equivalent is the integral from zero to L rho times this. But since this beam is symmetric, with respect to the center displacement, I do this. I take the integral from zero to L over two, but multiply that by two. Phi of X squared DX, plus I have only one mass here. So all I have, let me write that down. Summation of I is equal to one to n of m i phi of x evaluated at the location of that. So obviously I have only one mass, so I don't have this summation term. So if you perform this set of this integral, you will see that, okay, if you, uh, all I need to do is this, right? So, this would be that function squared. 
L cubed minus six L X squared plus four X cubed squared DX. And this one would be simply M one that I have here times this evaluated at L over two. So in other words, in this function, you substitute for X being L over two, square that, you get L cubed squared. Now the outcome of substitution of X equal to L over two here would be simply just L cubed, right? So uh, professor, now you have, yes. Does the first term need to be multiplied by density? Isn't it? Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes. How did I drop that? Here we go. Sorry about that. Yes. And same thing here. Okay. So this would become density is constant. So it comes out. And if you do the integration here, you see that you get a function like this. 36. You can see now why I'm avoiding writing those intermediate steps, okay? 16 X seven divided by seven minus four L four X cubed plus two L cubed X four minus L over two plus eight L X to the six evaluate from zero to L over two plus that M one L six, which is contribution of the lumnas. So if you simplify this, okay, you see that M equivalent comes out to be 0.4587 rho the L to the seven plus M one L six. If M one is zero, so the beam has um, no basically mass that M equivalent would be simply 0.4587 rho L to the seven. So this is the equivalent mass. How about for the equivalent the stiffness, you need to just evaluate this from again zero to L over two EI times second derivative of this with respect to X squared that DX. So you take the second derivative of this function with respect to X, square that second derivative of this function square that, then perform this integration. E and I are constant, would come out of this uh, integral and you see that this is what you will uh, get. You get uh, K equivalent comes out to be, if you substitute, let me write that down, phi of X, just for the record, is L cubed minus six L, uh, six L X squared plus four X cubed. So you need to find phi of X, second derivative of phi squared that perform this integration. You see that you end up with 48 EI over L cubed. which is the stiffness of a simply supported beam displaced in the middle, okay? So you can simply write natural frequency then would be uh, if you um, write that down would be the square root of K over M. I'm gonna go to the next place, write that down. And I have a reason for that. Natural frequency would be uh, simply 
this 48 EI over 0.45 4857 rho L to the four. I'm assuming M1, if for M1 is equal to zero, this is what you will get for the natural frequency. Or simplify that would come out to be 9.941 square root of EI over rho L to the four in radians per second. There is a table that you can actually go and find the exact natural frequency. And let's say we assume that M is like three times rho L, okay? For, I mean, M1. If you do that, uh, and substitute it here, you get M equivalent would be 0.4587 rho L to the seven plus three rho L seven. Assuming that the lumped mass is three times rho times L of the beam for this one. If you find a natural frequency now, you get, okay, of uh, 9.869 EI over rho L to the four, where the exact natural frequency is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is the exact natural frequency. The natural frequency you get from, by substituting this would be 48 EI over 3.486 rho L to the four. From the table for exact natural frequencies, you get this. For the problem we did, this is natural frequency we find. And you see that the error is roughly about 0.7%. It shows how powerful Rayleigh's method is in estimating the exact natural frequency of a system. So let me just summarize something here and give you, in fact, a heads up. I'm going to give you the project number one, okay? But before doing that, let me just say what that project is about because I'm not gonna give it to you right now. So project number one. I will give you a simple problem. I want you to experimentally measure the natural frequency. You may say, how in the world I'm gonna find a structure to do that? I will say that take as just a simple ruler, maybe steel or aluminum, that as your um, problem which I will, of course, elaborate that a little bit further next time. Then I want you to use Rayleigh's method and find the same natural frequency. And then look at some four tables where they have tabulated the exact natural frequency and then Compare all of these. I can assure you, you will be amazed to see how close the estimation by Rayleigh's method will be. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'll give you the problem, uh, the project uh, next time, and I will explain that. And it uh, would be a lot of fun because you can do something that realize that, well, the knowledge that I've gained so far is not too bad. I can do some interesting stuff. Any questions? If not, I'm gonna stop here, see where we go from here.